Well, good afternoon. I'm going to continue to talk today about the church sermon series that we started uh, last week. And uh, I'd hoped to have this sermon series be three sermons, but I got the flu. And so I had to combine the last two into just this one. And uh, so it's going to be twice as long. I hope you're ready for that. Uh, no, not really. But I thought it would be kind of nice to just do a mini-series with just two sermons, just to keep it fresh versus doing three, because you're always expecting three. And, uh, you know, just to add it back up, I'm going to have four points in my sermon today. So that way, I, you just, I'm just keeping you on your toes. That's my, that's my plan. I don't want to be too, too predictable. But the question is, why talk about the church? Surely there are other things we can talk about, and, and that's true, and we will. But I believe God put this series on my heart because of how important it is that we have the right attitudes and perspectives on the church. Because when we have the wrong attitudes, things go off kilter. When we think of the church as a business, not a bride, the wrong things become important and the important things get put to the side. When we think of the church as a mall instead of a temple, that subtle sense of it being all about me and my needs and my wants instead of being built into a temple where the Holy Spirit resides, that becomes what happens. When we think about the church as an institution instead of a body, then the politics and influence and leadership and manipulation become more important instead of humbly understanding that each part is different in its purpose but equal in its importance. And in all of these things, when we start thinking of the church in utilitarian terms, businesses, mall, institution, instead of bride, temple, and body, we begin to profane the sacred. We profane the sacred. We treat what God sees as sacred because he's in it as some kind of man-made thing. And I want to tell you, the church was not made by man. It was established and built by Jesus Christ who said to Peter, I'm going to, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. It belongs to him. But the church in America has a problem. And it's a, a problem that we need to pay attention to. Gallup does this long-term average that looks at how many people say they're going to church, and, and they actually look at that, and they look at how many people actually do, because it's interesting. A lot of people say that they go to church every week, but then when they actually study the numbers of those people that said they go to church every week, um, about 47% say they go to church every week, but only about 20% of the 47% actually do, uh, which is kind of interesting. So people's perception about how much they go to church and the reality of how much they go to church are somewhat different at least on polls. But the news in our country and in the research of what's going on in this, in, this church, in this country regarding church is not good, and you have to ask yourself, why is that? Why is it that in the United States, church attendance and church participation, church engagement is going down? And it has been for a long time. Gallup has been looking at this for a long time, and it's been just steadily going down. And you have to ask yourself, Why? In addition, you have to ask yourself about this life. Are, are we thriving as humans right now? Are we thriving as humans? There, there's never a time when we've had more food. There's never been a time where we've had more food than what we have right now. There's never been a time when we've had better technology than we have right now, ever. Ever in the history of humanity. We have more of everything. And it doesn't matter if you're in a first world country or a third world country. They have more of everything than we've ever had in the history of humanity. And yet, here's some disturbing statistics. Inflation was a source of stress for 83% of adults that were asked. 83% of adults said, hey, I'm worried my money doesn't go as far as it used to. 70, 70% of people don't think the people in government care about them. Now, we might smile and say, well, duh. But, but that, that's true, and, and that's really problematic in a country where in our founding documents we say that we have a government of the people and by the people. When 70% don't think the government cares about you. 64% in America feel that their rights are under attack. Left, right, in the middle, doesn't matter. 64% believe their rights are under attack. 
75% of black adults, 70% of Latino adults, and 69% of Asian adults feel the racial climate is a significant source of stress in their life. Now, here's a, here's a really big one. For women ages 18 to 34, so you can figure out who, who, what age group that's in, where that's at, said that they feel completely overwhelmed by stress most days. Women ages 18 to 34, 62% of them said they feel completely overwhelmed by stress most days. And 51% of men in the same age group said the same thing. Everybody knows that things under stress don't thrive. And what are the people in that age group doing with all that stress? Well, don't look now. When you go and look on the streets of America, you find people in that age group. And they're taking fentanyl, and they're taking whatever, they're self-medicating, because they just can't figure it out. In fact, all kinds of illnesses and dysfunctions are associated with stress. If you just have stress, stress, stress in your life, you get heart disease, you have all kinds of problems. And where are people turning to, to deal with the stuff in their life? And in the midst of all this, we have the church. The church. We are Wellspring Fellowship. We're Wellspring. The very, our very name speaks to our metaphor. We're to be a source of life in the community. We want the Holy Spirit rising up in us and, and spilling out to our community so we'd be a source of life. And the question is, are we being that? And there's this tendency in churches today to suddenly look at what's going on in the world and think, hey, we need to fix that. Right? Right? There are people experiencing homelessness. That's the new term. And so we need to let people camp out on our church grounds. That, that, well, that'll fix something. There are people experiencing addiction issues, so we need to be a drug ad addict counselor as a, as a congregation. That's what we need to be doing. The, there are people experiencing marriage issues, so we need to be marriage counselors now. People are hungry, so we need to be a food bank. The church is a hammer, and every social problem in the world is a nail, and we need to address it. None of those things are bad. God calls some churches, and he equips some of those churches to step into some of those spaces, and yet even more churches are stepping into those spaces. We continue to see church decline. So even though the churches are stepping into these places, the churches are doing these things, we're still seeing church in decline. We see less people believing. We see less baptisms. But I'll tell you the one thing we do not see less of. And I tell you, all you got to do is get on Google. It's an amazing thing. And that is we do not see less of church growth ideas or seminars on church growth articles or books. Right? You just church, church growth, type it into Google and see how many pages and pages and pages of, oh, these are the 15 things you've got to do to grow your church. These are the 12 tools you must have if you want to grow your church. These are the things to do. Or church organization ideas. Oh, this is what you need to have, this strategic thing over here and this strategic over thing, and you need to get your leadership together and come to our strategic seminar, and you can have this. I mean, you can just, just type in church leadership, and you're just going to find pages and pages and pages. And the declining numbers of people coming to church in the 1980s and 90s, church leaders got a little bit worried about that, and so they began to apply marketing techniques to the church. People said, hey, listen, you know, they saw Europe declining. They said, well, America didn't decline. We increased. Well, the reason is, is because we're better at marketing than Europe is, right? I mean, just taste their food. And so, and so look, you just, we're better at marketing than they are, and so we had a bump for a little while. But y'all got pretty savvy to it. So I want to suggest to you that even though we did all of that, the church in America is still in decline. And I want to say that, listen, the problem is both bigger and smaller than that. I think the church needs to really refocus itself. But not refocus on doing things better or bigger or more, but refocus and do the simple things 
really well. In fact, I want to suggest to you that's what we are really called to. We need to refocus on what God actually established in the church instead of all the things it's so easy to get distracted by in the church. And may Drake preach this, this scripture that I'm going to be also looking at today, but I'm going to be looking at it from a different perspective, and it's in the book of Acts. And it talks about the early church, the just starting out church and what they did. And sometimes we have the wrong idea about the early church, and we think, well, they were a special case. No, they weren't a special case. They're just an example of what it's supposed to be like. In Acts 2, verse 42 through 47 is what I'm going to be focusing on, and it says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe in the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions to, to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. And they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And today I want to look at this scripture not just as a reporting of the facts on what the early church did, but I want to suggest to you that this scripture should be normative as to what the church is all about. This scripture should be normative as to what the church should be all about. And the first thing we notice is this. We realize that they devoted themselves. It was not a, I'll be part of your church if the timing is right, if I can work it out on my schedule. Right? That wasn't it. They devoted themselves. They were, they were followers, not fans. Right now, Drake and, and Scott and I are going through a book called Not a Fan. Are you a fan of Jesus Christ or are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Because the two are not the same. Not the same. How devoted are you? Well, we have to look at what were they devoted to. And the first thing they were devoted to was the apostles' teachings. They were devoted to the apostles' teachings. And which ones? Well, all of them. All of them, right? I mean, look at what we have in Scripture after the book of Acts. We have the, the book of Romans, which is Paul's magnus opum, uh, his magnum opus, his masterpiece of theological reflection. And, and what is the book of Romans about? Well, his teaching about Christ, what Christ did, and how we can live in Christ, and how the Gentiles and Jews can relate to Christ, and how life in the Spirit ought to look like, and how we should get along with each other. And he's a lot more detailed than that, but you can look for yourself. Those are his major themes, right? And in, first, and in Corinthians, the letters to the Corinthians, he's addressing the problems they're having, like getting along and divisions and how they're looking at spiritual gifts wrong and, and how to have the right perspective about that. And they have some sexual sin issues in their church, and they need to deal with that. And then because his first letter wasn't enough, he wrote a second letter. He says, listen, this is how you're supposed to get along and treat each other, and we need to forgive as Christ did, and how to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And then in Galatians, a book about how we do not have to be Jews in order to follow Jesus. And then Ephesians, how to love and live with each other and be unified. Philippians, I need to imitate Christ's humility in how I live and place no confidence in my flesh, but in the Spirit of God that pulls me forward. In Colossians, Christ is superior to everything. He is all in all, and since we participated with him, here's how we ought to live. First and second Thessalonians, more practical living and answering some of their basic questions, even some about death and Jesus coming back. First and second Timothy, Paul says, listen, here's how you're supposed to set up the church and organize social life. In Hebrews, Jesus is better. He's better than angels, than Moses, than Melchizedek, and his covenant is way better than the old covenant. And here's what that means. And James says, let's make it practical. First Peter says, yeah, and here's how you should get along in this life because of Jesus Christ. Live holy, here's how. And first and second and third John, love each other. And Jude, times are going to be tough. False teachers are going to be around, but they will be destroyed. Persevere, save some from the fire. In Revelation, all seven letters apply, and they speak to perseverance in our heart for Jesus and what is to come. And as we look through these books, there's not one single book devoted to church growth. Not one. There is not the, the, the first and second church growth seminar right after Hebrews. There is not a, a leadership of Melchizedek book. There's not, here's the bylaws of the new church. 
None of that's there. In fact, if you were to sum up all these teachings, it was a lot more interested in making sure we understand what Christ did and what that means for how we live and then how we should treat each other. That was the teachings of the apostles. I mean, really, if you just look in the, in the New Testament, how much of the New Testament is written about how we should treat each other because of Christ. So we need to be about this Word of God, not about all the other stuff that churches get so tangled up in. We need to be devoted to the teachings of the apostles and how to live that out, not chasing the culture for what the latest and greatest event is or what the greatest and latest book is or the thing that's going to grow the church. The early church were devoted to learning and applying the apostles' teachings, and that is so much more simple than some of the stuff that we sometimes try and do as churches. And listen, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I've been, I was a part of that culture in the, in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. It's so much more simple to say, listen, we're devoted to the apostles' teachings. That's, that's one of the things we're going to be devoted to. I mean, that's just simple. There it is. But simple doesn't mean easy, but it does mean straightforward, lacking complexity. And we've made it too complex and lost the simplicity of simply following. As a church, we need to make sure we're devoted to the apostles' teachings. The apostles' teachings. But that's just the beginning because they were also devoted to fellowship. To fellowship. If you, to give you a practical definition of fellowship, because most people don't hear the word fellowship unless they're watching Lord of the Rings series. And, and so fellowship is simply this, followers of Christ doing life together. Followers of Christ doing life together. You see, just as they were devoted to the apostles' teachings... They were devoted to fellowship. It doesn't say they were devoted to the apostles' teachings more than to fellowship. It just says they were devoted to these four things. So they're devoted to fellowship. And sometimes people have the wrong idea about fellowship. They think that fellowship is the icing on the cake. It's, they think it's the added on fun stuff that we do, but after all, it's just fellowship. And they wrongly assume that fellowship is easy and effortless because it doesn't, and it doesn't take effort or devotion, but they were devoted to fellowship. You see, church is funny because it brings people together who in their regular lives would not associate together. Right? That's the interesting thing about church. It, it takes a cross-section from white-collar professionals to blue-collar tradesmen, doctors to gardeners, moms who are professionals to professional moms, and all together it mixes them all together. And yet, even though we have all these different experiences and backgrounds, even though we have different preferences, we choose to come together and we're devoted to doing life together. And even more, we're to love each other. Jesus said this, and the Apostle John's teaching is really centered around it. He says this, my command in John 15, 12 through 14, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends if you do what I command. 1 Thessalonians 4.9, Now about your love for one another, we don't need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. 1 Peter 1.22, Now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. You see, fellowship begins with this choice. We choose to love each other. We choose to love each other. But then it goes further. Listen to the Apostle Paul's teaching in Galatians. Uh, that would be chapter 6, I think. 6, uh, verses 2 through 5. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks there's something, when they're not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions, and then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Remember those statistics on how stressed out people are? You know what? If you're doing life alone, that's really stressful. That is really stressful. Stress can get you, oh, how we need to do life together. We need to do life together. In, in the good times when everything is going well, our fellowship builds the bonds. It builds the connections to each other. Because here's what I know. In this world, we will have trouble. In this world, we will have trouble. This week was, was 
incredible, incredibly horrible week for someone I know. She was someone I grew up with, and she's my age. And just recently, she found out that her husband, who is 60, was diagnosed with early onset dementia. We know about that here. And so they're going to have to walk through that together. And then on Tuesday, her daughter, who was in her early 20s, was driving near Moses Lake and hit a patch of ice, and her car spun into an oncoming propane tanker, and she was instantly killed. Boom. In just a couple of weeks, their entire life just changed. Just changed. My brother Aaron, who was somehow in contact with them, she said this. She said, we don't even know what to do. We don't even know what to do. I I texted him. I said, I hope they have a pastor and a church family to gather around them. See, that is this life. If you want to understand the importance of fellowship, that is the moment to understand it. See, that's what fellowship is about. (laughs) Potluck's great. I love potluck. I missed the last one. I'm like, I'm still in mourning about that. Of all the ones to miss, Thanksgiving potluck. But, but it, that's great, but I've got to tell you, that's not the heart of fellowship. In fact, we're going to talk about the breaking of bread next, and that's, that's down there. The, the heart of fellowship is gathering around people and doing life together. And in this life, it's not just all happy, happy, go, go. Isn't it fun? In a heartbeat, things go wrong. And when things go wrong and you're all alone, what are you going to do? That's what this world's dealing with. They're all alone. They're out there and they're dealing with this stuff. This stuff hits. How about a cancer diagnosis? When you lose a loved one, when everything comes toppling down, the, your, your investment about being devoted in fellowship, when we're devoted in fellowship, we are building the investment for when trials come. And that's when the church gathers around those who are hurting and we cry with those who cry. And we hold up the ones who are falling down. That is fellowship. When we're devoted to fellowship, we're being transparent. We confess to each other our struggles. We're real with each other, not plastic people, but are authentic. And we walk side by side together through this life with all of its trials. That's what it means to be devoted to fellowship. That's what the early church was. They were devoted to fellowship. They were also devoted to the breaking of bread. (laughs) The breaking of bread. What does that mean? Well, it actually has a double meaning. On the one hand, it says they would go from house to house breaking bread with each other. And you might be thinking that that's fellowship, but it's distinguished from fellowship. So unless they're just repeating themselves for emphasis in the Bible, we know that it must be something different. So the breaking of bread is different than fellowship. So what was it? I think it speaks more to the camaraderie they had together. The camaraderie. Not only were they walking side by side, but they enjoyed the rich social life together. A rich social life together. God established the church. Can you believe it? God established the church so we could enjoy each other's company. God is so good. Amen? Amen? He made it so we could get together and enjoy each other's company. So we could do game nights and costume parties and slating in the snow and camping together, right? And it says they were devoted to it. Sometimes we make light of those things. But these people were devoted to it, and it didn't just happen. It was something they did and, and perp, on purpose. Look at Psalm 133. Amazing. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. A couple weeks back, we talked about anointing. How this precious oil is that? Listen, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's not insignificant at all. That's why they were devoted to it. 
It's the bestowing of God's blessing. And, and Jesus prays for our unity in John 17. God, I pray that they would be one as we're one. And then Paul says this in Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You know, the enemy hates unity. In fact, he will do everything he can to prevent it, and if it exists, to destroy it. And here's some of his favorite tools. Gossip. Speaking ill of somebody, speaking critically, tearing down someone when they're not present. Nothing will destroy unity faster than gossip. And you know what? If you're gossiping about me and I know it, I'm not going to go break bread with you at your house. And we have to guard our hearts against gossip. We're not all the same kind of people. Some of us rub each other the wrong way. Oh, this really bugs me. Why can't they be more like me? Right? Which is essentially what we're saying. And the evil one wants to destroy our unity. So someone out there gets their tail bent out of shape, and rather than forgiving or understanding, we snipe and gripe, and we're critical. And then we choose to do that. We're instruments of the evil one. When we choose to do that, we're motivated by hate, not love. Because when you understand that the consequences for such a thing are that the church becomes divided, and a divided church becomes unaffected, and an unaffected church fails to accomplish the fundamental teachings of the apostles, which is to share Christ, the resurrected Savior, and save some from the fire, what you understand is that gossip is sending people to hell. And that's motivated by hate. That's the only thing. We can't tolerate it. We can't put up with it. We can't even have a taste of it. Not in here. That's why God lists it with murder and sexual immorality. God hates gossip. You know what another tool the evil one wants to use is clicks. Small social groups that are closed. That are closed. Sometimes clicks are accidental. Other times, not so much. Breaking bread in each other's houses, spending time together, doing various things. These are click busters. These are click busters. Because we do these different things. And a small church needs to work hard at being sure we don't ever go there. We need to be open. Does that mean every time you spark up your barbecue, you have to invite the entire church? <laughs> right? Oh, man, we're going to need to buy ribs. You know, that, that would make it mean we'd never do that, right? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that we're open in the way we do our social gatherings. We're open. And, and being devoted to breaking bread means that we're devoted to being uh, sure that no one is left out. Making sure no one is left out, Right? So we, we always do our best to make sure, and we just look around, we have the eyes of being devoted to the breaking of bread with one another. We're saying, oh, wow, you know what? I've never had them over to our house. We're going to have them over. You know, those people, I just don't seem to be able to include them. And you know what? I've never really talked to them. Let's bring them into our house so we can break bread together. And that's particularly true of new folks, people who are just discovering Jesus, who are, who are learning about becoming connected to the church. Oh, man, we need to gather them in. We gather worshipers, and we have to be devoted to it because, you see, the second meaning of breaking bread was to take communion. That was the second meaning. And so when he said they were devoted to breaking bread together, it was not just breaking bread of having food together and having a party night and watching the hawks. It was, hey, we're, we take communion together. Oneness with the church that was and is and will be. There was one last area where the church of Acts was devoted. They were devoted to prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says this, Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I recently did an entire sermon series on prayer, so I'm not going to repeat myself today, but we need to be devoted to prayer. Not just occasionally doing it, but devoted to it. Devoted to prayer. In all occasions, in all circumstances, and with great fervor, we need to be in prayer. The prayer of a righteous person has really big impacts. 
So what's the result of the church that is being devoted in this way, devoted to apostles' teachings, devoted to fellowship, devoted to breaking of bread, devoted to prayer? Well, look at what it says. They devoted themselves to these things, right? And then verse 43, and then everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together, and they held everything in common. And they sold property and possessions and give it to everyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet each other in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see, when we're that kind of church, when we're devoted to those things, then the Holy Spirit will do His work as He determines, and He will place His gifts in the church. Whether that's miraculous healings or word of knowledge or encouragement, spiritual gifts. When we're devoted to those four things. We'll hold all things in common. Now, I, I don't own a tractor, but I have three brothers that do. Amen. Amen. And if I know that if I need some tractor work done in my place, all three of them will just sign up to figure out which one of them gets to come. Wow. I don't have a lift to fix my car, but in Christ I have a brother who does. Right? It's not my lift, but it is. Because we hold it in common. We hold it in common. It's not communism. It's not an endorsement of communism. Rather, it's to say that we are so connected in this way that everything I have is yours. If I have something you need, listen, if you need decoys, I got you covered. Amen? And when people have needs, needs they're met. You know, doing life together, we've t- I've talked with people who needed things, things like cars. People needed a car, and, 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 and people gave one to them. That's amazing. A month of rent. We've done that. You don't know about it because we don't stand up here and say, hey, we're going to put out the offering plate, and, and because so-and-so, you know, Drake needs rent money this month, and, you know, so we're just going to pass the plate. We, we don't do that kind of thing. We, we do it quietly behind the scenes. And, and you know what? We've helped numerous people with needs like that because we're doing life together. We're not a social agency. We're a church. We can't do that for all the people in the world, but we can do that with people in here. And you know what? The early church did life together, and you know what they found it was? They found that it was fun. How do I know that? Because they enjoyed the favor of the people that were around them. You ever been around happy people? Amen. It's fun to be around happy people. It's fun to be around people that are having fun. You know what's terrible? Being around grumpy people. Being around people who are not having any fun in their life. You go talk to them and you're like, wow, I feel depressed even talking to you. But the people, they had the favor of the people that were around them. Why? Because they're great people to be around. They weren't out protesting at funerals. They were impacting people around them. And then look what happens. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They didn't have to go to church growth seminars. They didn't have to go to all this kind of stuff. They didn't have to use the top ten words in their tweets to be able to get people to link on it and like it and subscribe. They didn't have to market the gospel of Jesus Christ because the Lord added to their church those who were being saved. They were the aroma of Christ to those who were being saved and those who were perishing. Why? Because they were devoted to four simple things. Four simple things. And you know what? The evil one has a really insidious lie wants to tell the church and especially us little churches here's what he wants to say we are not enough we're not enough we're inadequate we're too small we're insignificant we're not doing enough 
You see, it's the same lie, but a little different shape from the lie that our trust in Jesus is enough. So many people add all kinds of things to their faith to make sure they get in, right? But it's by faith that we're saved, not by works, so that no one can boast. Not by works. Jesus Christ did it. See, it's an infection of the culture that says you have to be growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger to count yourself successful. It, it, it's a lie. When, when you look at the numbers, you can put that first slide up there. When, when you look at the numbers of what church looks like in, in, in the United States, it's pretty amazing. First slide, go ahead. Yeah, throw that first slide up there. Yeah, look, this is what we find out. 59% of the churches in America are just like us. 59%. Of all churches by location, 177,000 small churches are just like us, between zero and 99 attendees. In fact, the average attendance of small churches in America is 60. Like Glenn says, anybody can be average, and most people are. Amen? Right? That's it. Nine million worshipers come to churches just like ours. And Satan would love to tell 59% of the churches, you're not enough, you're not good enough, you're not going to be successful, you're not impacting the culture, and it's a lie. It's a lie. In fact, look at the second slide, because this is pretty amazing too. Medium small churches, which is 100, so we have 101 people, we graduate into the medium small church, to 599, that represents 35% of all churches by location, 105,000 medium small churches, 25 million worshipers, add that to the 9 million worshipers in the United States, and what do you get? You get 94% of all the churches in America are 499 and smaller. And Satan wants to tell all of us, well, you're, you're not good enough. You're too little. You need to get more administration. You need to get more statements. You need to get more organization. You need to get this and that. And you need to do this and this and this. And if you're not doing all this, then whoops, you're just not significant. Because guess what? You don't look like Elevation Church, which represents 0.2% of the churches in the United States. 0.2%. Yeah. There's another size. It's a little bit bigger. You can look at the next one. Yeah. 599 represents four. So now we're at 98. And then we get bigger than that. One more size. Right? 2% from 0 to 99. And then when you get bigger than 199, or 1,999, you start getting into a very, very small thing. Like Saddleback Church in, South, in, in Southern California where if you win the lottery, you can visit the pastor for 15 minutes once in your lifetime. Because if you have 20,000 worshipers in attendance, and you divide up how old their pastor is and how much life he has left, right, figure it out. Do the math. I mean, you'd be like Willy Wonka. You're opening the candy bar. I get to visit Pastor Warren. Right? You see... It would seem that God loves using small things to do big things. It's not that big is evil, and praise God, we, we use all kinds of things from them, right? And God has equipped them and empowered them to do all kinds of things, and I praise God for them. But I want you to understand that God uses small things to do really big things, and we're in a group of 94% of all the churches in America, and we can say to Satan, hey, get lost, because God likes to do big things with little things. And the Lord will add to the church those who are being saved. Our success is not defined by our size. And it's not all the extra complications. It's not because we went to 10 church growth seminars. It's not because we have a denomination or some kind of administrative structure. It's not documents and strategies, advertising and marketing, or any of the man-made th things we do. Instead, it is simply this. Our success comes from being devoted to four simple things. Devoted to the apostles' teachings. Devoted to fellowship. Walking hand in hand, side by side, good times and bad times. Being devo devoted to the breaking of bread. And all the joy that that brings. And being devoted to prayer. Wow. That's the church 
Christ established. And it's simple. And by doing the simple things really well, we're fulfilling Christ's intentions for the church. Let's be that simple, devoted church. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us instructions about what your church is really all about. And God, I confess that there have been times when I was on the wrong track. I was listening to the culture that was all around me. And instead, God, I wasn't listening enough to you. And so I pray, Lord, that we as Wellspring Fellowship would be the church that is devoted to the things that you want us to be devoted to, the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. It's simple. It's simple. It's not complicated. It's straightforward. It's direct. And when we do that, your spirit will inhabit this place. You'll do signs and wonders, and it'll be amazing, and we'll just look at awe at what you do. And there'll be joy, and the people around us in the community will see what we're doing and say, man, I want to be with those people. Those people are always having a good time. And you will add to this church those who are being saved. And God, we see in this culture that it's going the wrong way. And our heart grieves for the lost. But you said that would come too. Yet we're to be faithful and devoted to these simple things. Even in the midst of that. Help us be that as people. And help us be that together as your church. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.